Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, your fatherly tenderness never ceases to provide for our needs. We ask you to bestow on this gathered community the riches of your blessing. With the gift of grace, sanctify those who are here tonight so that, faithful to your commandments, they will care for each other, ennoble this world by their lives, and reach the home you have prepared for them in heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The class tonight is uh, chapter 22 of the uh, catechism that you have, Sacramentals and uh, Popular Devotions. And as I was uh, preparing for the class tonight, I read the story that uh, introduces the chapter uh, entitled The Rosary Priest and Father Patrick Payton because uh, he is a priest who uh, ministered worldwide and within my memory. He uh, only died in 1992. And I had forgotten his story that uh, before he became a priest he was critically ill, had been an athletic young man and came down with tuberculosis and the doctors, and this was in the late 1920s I think, and the doctors uh, gave him no hope of uh, recovery and then someone came and visited him and entrusted him to the Blessed Virgin Mary and prayed the rosary with him and, and through that sacramental, if you will, uh, he experienced a, a healing. Uh, 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 a mir miraculous healing that even baffled uh, the doctors, his doctors at that time, and he made a full recovery. And because of that, that motivated him to want to give thanks to God and to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he eventually um, became a, a Catholic priest after he went into the seminary. And then he made it his mission to promote praying the Holy Rosary, which is a sacramental which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And he went worldwide uh, with this crusade, and it was called that, the, the Rosary Crusade. And um, his motto was, the family that prays together stays together. And what he tried to do uh, worldwide was to get families together praying the Rosary as often as they could, uh, daily or weekly or whatever, but within the family unit. And he felt that if they would do this, uh, God would bestow many blessings uh, upon them and that the Blessed Virgin Mary would intercede for them uh, and keep them together as a, a family unit. In fact, even in the South, I can remember seeing billboards with an image of Father uh, Patrick Payton um, and it would say the Rosary Crusade and then underneath of it, it, it would say the family that prays together stays together. So I think that that was a good introduction to this uh, chapter because the rosary and the blessings that we would receive from prayer, intercessory prayer, praying with one another, having the Blessed Virgin Mary intercede for us, uh, to her son who of course intercedes for us before the Heavenly Father, uh, all that reminds us of what the sacraments of the church uh, intend to do as well. And so a, a, a good definition of a sacramental is a sacred sign or sacred signs instituted, let me start over, the, the definition of a sacrament, the seven sacraments, is sacred sign instituted by Christ to show forth his real presence and action in the world, in the church. Uh, and the seven sacraments are baptism, confirmation, holy eucharist, which constitute the three sacraments of initiation, the means by which God brings us into the church. Uh, then the two sacraments of healing are penance and uh, anointing of the sick. And then the two sacraments of witness uh, and of, of uh, mission, if you will, are the sacrament of holy orders and holy matrimony. And holy matrimony was the one that we spoke of uh, last week. These are official church celebrations uh, that we call sacraments and we believe that Jesus Christ instituted all seven of them. Sacramentals on the other hand are sacred signs instituted by the church 
not necessarily by Christ, although we would say that Christ uh, is acting uh, through the instrument of his church to give us that which we need to help us to realize God's love for us and our need to participate in that love. But they are sacred signs instituted by the church uh, that bear resemblance to the sacraments but are not sacraments. They are sacramentals, things. Uh, or, or blessings or whatever. Sacramentals can point to the actual sacraments of the church or the church's intercessory prayer for every person. And normally a lay person can um, offer a sacramental, although not necessarily in every case, and we'll get into that as we uh, go more specifically. But there are, uh, here are some of the sacramentals. I was thinking as I was looking at this chapter and thinking of other sacramentals that, that there are many others that I did not include in my class tonight, but, uh, but there are a great number of them. I would say the first among them are blessings. Blessings either offered by a bishop, priest, or a deacon, which are not sacraments, but they call upon God's uh, blessing upon the person who receives them. And not only that, uh, a bishop, priest, or deacon can bless objects, can bless uh, um, office buildings, can bless automobiles, can bless all kinds of things and ask God's divine protection uh, and benefits upon these inanimate objects. Uh, and to set them aside for uh, the glory of God, so to speak. In fact, uh, the priests have a, a, um, a book, this is an abridged version of a much larger book, uh, called uh, The Book of Blessings. And let me just go through the table of contents so that you'll know what these blessings are. And these can be done anywhere. They could be done within a, a church setting, let's say not at Mass necessarily, but it could be at Mass. Uh, but it could be a, a prayer service at church, or I could go into somebody's home and offer one of these sacramentals as well. But let me get to the table of contents, and uh, I'll just read you a few of the um, blessings that are available to you in the official um, book of blessings of the Catholic Church. The first uh, chapter has the order of blessing of families and members of families. Uh, and you can do it uh, for a family in general or the annual blessing of families in their own homes. You can do it during Mass or outside of Mass if you wish. <clears throat> you can bless sons and daughters. You can bless an engaged couple. Uh, you can bless parents before childbirth. You can bless mothers of uh, before they give childbirth or after childbirth, which used to be called the churching of women. We don't call, that it, call it that anymore. We can bless uh, parents after a miscarriage. We can bless parents of an adopted child. Uh, we can bless people on their birthday. Uh, the blessing of elderly people, which I now qualify for. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, But these can be done either during Mass or, or outside of Mass or in the home of the person, or, or wherever you might encounter them. So it doesn't have to be in the church per se. Then there's also a blessing of the sick. Um, um, a blessing of adults who are sick, blessing of children who are sick, blessing of persons suffering from addiction or from substance abuse, a uh, blessing of, of, of a victim of crime or of oppression. And then there are blessings that pertain to uh, the handing of the faith to others and to communal prayer. Uh, the blessing of a meeting that might be designed such as this, a catechetical meeting. Um, uh, or the blessing of, a, of students and teachers. Or the blessings of those gathered for any kind of meeting, whether it's ecumenical, interfaith, or, or just a, a secular meeting where there's some Christ Christians present and are asking for, for a blessing at that meeting or for organizations. There are blessings for pilgrims as they set out on a pilgrimage. There are blessings for travelers uh, as well. Then there are blessings related to buildings and to various forms of human activity. 
the blessing of a new home. That's one of the most common that I do. I'm invited to people's houses uh, and I, I do a blessing and I sprinkle it with holy water, which is another sacramental. And we uh, pray uh, an Our Father, Hail Mary and Glory Be. And, and then hopefully they give me a nice dinner afterwards to pay me. Uh, so <laughs> very nice, actually. Uh, but blessings of homes are very, very uh, meaningful. Or uh, we can bless offices, shops, or factories. In fact, when I was in Augusta, there was a, a nationwide um, drugstore or pharmacy that was bought out by CVS. But before it was bought out by CVS, there may have been some here. I think it was Big B. Does anybody remember that? Big B? Yeah, Big or uh, No, it wasn't KMB. It was Big B Pharmacy, I think, or something like that. Was it? Well, anyway, the, the owners of this chain, before they sold out, <laughs> were, were Catholic. And they insisted that every store where, uh, that they opened would be blessed by a Catholic priest. So when I was in Augusta, I got called three times by Protestant managers saying, well, the owner of this place is Catholic, and they want you to come and bless this place. Now, he was clueless as to what it was uh, all about, but this was orders from on high, from his uh, corporation. And so, in fact, they had a crucifix already there, and I went in and I blessed the store. Um, for, so, so, um, so that's quite permissible to, to bless someone's place of business. We can also bless centers of social communications or a gymnasium, gymnasium or a field for athletics. We can bless various means of transportation such as an automobile, a bus, a plane, a, a boat. We can bless fishing gear. <laughs> we can. That's right here. <laughs> I've never done that, but <laughs> nobody's asked me to bless their uh, fishing pole yet, but there is a blessing here. Um, there's a blessing of tools. Uh, there's a blessing of animals. Of course, I've done that many times. There's a blessing of field and flocks. I've never done that. There's a blessing of seeds at planting time. There's a blessing on the occasion of Thanksgiving for the harvest, or the blessing of an athletic event, uh, and of course, the blessings before and after meals. There are the blessings of religious articles, the blessing of rosaries, uh, the blessing of the advent wreath, of the Christmas manger, of the Christmas tree, um, of throats, <laughs> blessing of throats, which occurs uh, every February 3rd on the Feast of St. Blaise, who was a bishop and martyr, and when he, um, he, was in, he encountered a young boy who was choking on a fishbone. And the bishop uh, blessed him, and the boy was um, actually able to cough it up, and, and uh, the bishop, through his blessing, was credited for having saved the life of that young boy. And the church has um, continued that blessing to this very day using blessed candles, which are sacramentals as well, from the day before, which is called Candlemas, which is today, February 2nd which is also the official title is the presentation of the Lord in the temple where Simeon is able to speak and declares who uh, Jesus is. Uh, tonight as a conclusion to our class I'm going to bless your throats and I'll show you the candle that we will do that. So, so since it's after sundown we can technically say it's already February 3rd. So I'll be able to um, honor St. Blaise uh, this evening as the closing prayer of tonight's class. There's also uh, the blessing of ashes on Ash Wednesday, the blessing of St. Joseph's table on March 19th. This is more of an Italian custom that in the middle of Lent you uh, step out of Lent on the solemnity of St. Joseph and you have all kinds of food on the table in the church, uh, uh, usually Italian food uh, and sweets and everything <laughs> else, and uh, these are blessed on that day. And it's more a custom of, in parishes that have a large Italian uh, heritage or community. There's um, the blessing of food for the first meal of Easter. There's an order of visiting a cemetery on All Souls Day. The blessing of food on Thanksgiving Day. The blessing of food or drink or other elements connected with devotions. Um, um, so you can see there's a lot of blessing of foods and drinks. Um, there's the blessing of a pastoral council. Blessing of parish societies. Blessing on the occasion of the inauguration of a public official. So there are all kinds of blessings, and each one of these, and there are probably others that are not in here, are considered sacramentals. They're not official sacraments of the church, but they uh, 
accomplish in, in the believer who experiences them or witnesses them uh, that God's blessings are in the world and we can call upon God to bless just about anything, including fishing gear. So, um, so it, it, in some ways, sacramentals uh, are serious, but they're also fun. Uh, the, the, so there's a, a, a lightness uh, to these sacramentals, uh, not all of them, but 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 you know like, these sorts of things are, are just plain fun. Yes. You know, Pope Julius the second placed candles after he directed the proper placing of the candles to better reach the enemy. Well, you know, uh, during the Vietnam War, when there was the peace movement, uh, Cardinal Cushing, I think, of New York would bless uh, the military before they went into to battle and he was criticized for that uh, but during that period of time by the, 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 the peace movement people but, but that's quite permissible to bless your armies uh, even though they're going into war but the Catholic Church has an awareness that war is, is evil but it, sometimes there's a, a just cause or just purpose for that and so you would ask God's blessing certainly upon uh, those going into uh, to war. So. So the blessings uh, are sacramentals. Actions such as processions are sacramentals. Now, in the South, we don't experience processions outside of Mass uh, or in the community quite as they would do in um, predominantly Catholic communities, especially in Europe and in South and Central America. Now, you will experience these in this country, but they're usually uh, import, imported by the immigrants uh, who come from these other places and then establish them here. Um, in the South or in the United States, the, the biggest procession that most Catholics are, are familiar with are the May processions honoring the Blessed Virgin Mary because May is the month of Mary. Um, and it's uh, by a, a May procession, we do it here with our school children and we also do it on Mother's Day because Mother's Day is always in um, May and so we honor the Blessed Virgin Mary on Mother's Day as well. But our school will process from uh, in their finery, not just their, uh, they don't wear their, uh, they wear their nicest clothes and those who've already made their first communion wear their first communion dresses. And they're led from the school down the street, around the front and into the church. It's a wonderful procession. And then there's a prayer service and benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. That would be considered a sacramental. The Mexicans uh, make a grand festival or fiesta of, of the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe in December and have outdoor processions. In fact, I think St. Peter Claver does a wonderful outdoor procession uh, on that feast because of their Hispanic, uh, pr predominantly Mexican community, as well as um, Sacred Heart and Warner Robins. They have all kinds of, of activities that are not sacraments, they're devotionals, uh, and these would be called uh, um, uh, sacramentals. Or, or if you go to, to, to Italy, uh, Naples, there's processions where saints are carried in procession, and, and they're very loose. There's no rigid way to do these things or these prayer services. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, of enculturation and, and the blowing of trumpets and the, the popular music of the people but set to uh, religious words uh, and it's all done outside so it's loud and it tries to get people and it's very public in fact one of the the most wonderful and most marvelous processions in Rome is on the feast of Corpus Christi uh, and technically that's always the Thursday before let me see uh, it's the Corpus Christi is always the third it's, it's after it's Easter and I can't remember what the, there's a formula to figure out what day Corpus Christi is. But anyway, there's always a Eucharistic procession. And the Holy Father, the Pope, and in, in the recent past it's been obviously Pope Benedict, he will celebrate an outdoor mass, or sometimes indoor mass, at uh, a basilica in Rome called St. John Lateran, which is actually the, the cathedral church of Rome. St. Peter's is not the cathedral of Rome. Uh, St. John Lateran is, and it's older than St. Uh, Peter's Basilica. Then, after Mass, they put the consecrated host into a, 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 a monstrance uh, that displays the host, and they go outside with it in grand procession and put this host on a kind of a table-like structure or a pedestal and secure it on the back of a, 
1998 Chevy pickup, okay? <laughs> That's very nicely decorated. But it's a big Chevy, you know, a, when you look at it, you know this is a Chevy pickup uh, in Rome. And then the Pope gets in the back of the uh, Chevy pickup, in the, the flat bed of it, and there's a kneeler for him there as, long as, as well as a chair. And he either kneels or sits, because it's a long procession, and they go from the Basilica of St. John Lateran, and they drive to uh, the Basilica of St. Mary Major and then conclude with benediction of the Blessed Sacrament there. But the Pope drives through one of the busiest uh, commercial streets in Rome that has all of the most popular and most expensive uh, department stores, boutiques, and restaurants. And the people are going about their business, uh, eating outside, shopping, and then all of a sudden this tremendous procession comes down this main street and some people, you can, you can see it on TV, some people are, are disinterested, others, you know, watch and kneel and, and make the sign of the cross. Uh, but it's just an amazing procession uh, in the heart of Rome with the Holy Father on the back of a pickup truck. And <laughs> so there's something whimsical about it too. Uh, but it's, it's, it's our Lord in the midst of the world where either he is acknowledged or disregarded, uh, which is what occurred in his public ministry as well. But it's a sacramental of that. It's not an official ceremony of the church. I'm not sure what the history of that is, but you know, there are different places throughout the Pardon? Oh, is that right? I'm not sure uh, what the right. Yeah, it's possible. But there are other Eucharistic processions on that day throughout the world, and in some places, they you remember the uh, all the flowers we had upstairs, and then we had that thing that looked like a carpet uh, on the angle of the steps. Well, there are some places that will do that in a, a mile-long fashion along the street. So different people do different things, and it looks just like that with different religious symbols in it. And then the priest walks through it with the Blessed Sacrament as he carries it. Yes? How come we've never seen a picture? How come we've never seen a picture of the Pope riding in the back of the pickup truck? Oh, the, it's on TV. I've seen it on, it's, it's, it's televised on EWTN when he does this. I've never seen a picture. I think if you Google Pope Benedict II on a pickup truck, that picture will come up. <laughs> <laughs> now the pickup truck is is decorated. Uh, it looks like a float, but you can tell it's a Chevy pickup. Uh, anybody else? Yes. What about a um, uh, funeral in New Orleans? Would that count as a a funeral procession in New Orleans? The jazz uh, funeral processions. That's a sacramental where they go from the church to the cemetery, and they have this jazz music going on. And that's how the church uh, ideally enculturates. It doesn't necessarily, although we've been doing some enculturation with the official sacraments of the church, I feel like those have kind of fallen flat. But these devotionals or sacramentals that are apart from the actual sacraments of the church, like in a procession from point A to point B at a funeral, and incorporating the culture of New Orleans, that's very much permitted, you know. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a flexibility in that. But that's a, a, another good example of an American uh, custom that um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how jazz developed in, in New Orleans, but uh, it comes from that culture, to say, to say the least. Uh, yes? When did you say that would happen again with the procession? Uh, this I Feast of Corpus know. Christi, which is always after Easter. I think it's before the Feast of the Sacred Heart, but I'm not sure. Yes, it's always, oh, I'm sorry, in this country we've moved it from Thursday to Sunday, so that helps me to remember better. Uh, it's, uh, you have Pentecost Sunday, then you have Trinity Sunday, you have uh, the last Sunday of Easter, Pentecost Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and then Corpus Christi. So it varies, uh, it's based on the date of Easter. Yes. So does the Day Day Festival count for that? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the St. Patrick's Day parade uh, is a sacramental, and one, it really it started off as a very purely religious event, and then the culture, the city took it over <laughs> and turned it into debauchery. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but the procession, there's religious people, I mean, the procession itself, the parade itself has, you know, it, it's, it is a religious procession to honor St. Patrick. So you can say that that's a sacramental as well. There was a question over here. No, no, no. We 
did uh, Corpus Christi procession here. Right? Oh yes, we did that here one year. It, now, and it was the latest it could be. It was like in almost July, and it was 150 degrees outside. <laughs> I had all the vestments on, and we had to walk miles, and, and I was almost dead at the end of it. But uh, so we didn't do it the next year. <laughs> But we may do it again this year, we'll see. It's because of where it falls, it's a little bit tough for us here in the South to do it appropriately. And we don't have a very good custom in making of doing these. Although we had a, a significant number of people to join us, so we may do it again. Sometimes I, I like processions in the church a little bit better because the air conditioning is on. <laughs> <laughs> but St. Patrick's Day in Savannah is very good, yes. Oh yeah, we can do whatever we want. The thing is to get people to come. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, and you know, if, if it was, um, you know, like the cherry blossom stuff is, is secular, but if that had a religious uh, theme to it that attracted people, it, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, uh, but we don't have that here. We don't have a religious theme that draws people. We could do that during the cherry blossom. Yes have a, a religious procession of some kind of St. Joseph down through the streets. Yes, on pedestal and have the Knights of Columbus and <laughs> draw it on. And I'd be on the back of the pickup draw. Okay, very good. Okay. Would the March of uh, for Life be... Uh, the March for Life, I think, is a sacramental, definitely, in Washington and down here. Now, obviously, it's not Catholic sponsored, the one here, and the one in Washington is, is broad-based, but, uh, but it's the same principle, I think, yeah. Yes, yes, very nice. And people, uh, the Catholics in particular, carry things along in the, the March for Life, uh, the statues and crosses and all the rest of that. Yes, we had 20 kids there. Did you? I thought that they were there the week before, and that's what I was kind of wondering about. That. <laughs> no, they were there that Monday. What color were they? I, I, I have no idea where they were, yeah, yeah, colors. yeah. Mm -hmm. To identify yeah, them. Yeah. And, you know, and, they were yeah. just and this is the first time we sent anybody up there from here, and I'm hoping next year we'll have an even larger number once you break the ice and get others to consider it. Um, the other, another uh, sacramental would be the Holy Rosary. Now, the rosary bead uh, comes in all shapes, sizes, colors. Some are very expensive, have diamonds instead of plastic beads and uh, others have pearls and mine is just plastic, but anyway. Um, but it's tangible. It's a prayer, but it's tangible. That's why it's a sacramental. When we bless it, we set it aside for sacred use. Anything that's blessed is to remind us of the sacred and to send, set it aside for sacred use. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the rosary because I would say that this is one of the most popular devotions in the Catholic Church because you can do it communally or you can do it privately. You can hold it in your hand and not say a thing. And, and it's like um, almost all major religions have some sort of beads that you can pray on. I think the, the Jews have something, the Muslims have something, we have the rosary. Episcopalians have the rosary as well, some branches of the Episcopal Church. Their rosary is... is, is uh, <laughs> Worry stone, things like that, but they're tangible remind, things to remind you uh, of things. Now, the, the history of the, the uh, rosary is, is interesting. Um, let's see where I'm finding. Um, many of the appearances of Mary, especially at Lourdes and Fatima, have been associated with the praying of the rosary, and numerous popes and saints have urged the faithful to pray the rosary. Opening the Marian year in 1987, the Rosary was a global prayer for peace offered by large groups at Marian shrines, such as those in Washington, Lourdes, Frankfurt, Manila, Bombay, Rio de Janeiro, and Dakar. In fact, I remember seeing that, and it was Pope John Paul II leading it uh, at the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome, and then there was this um, satellite interlinking to the other major churches throughout the world where people had gathered at the very same time for the recitation of the rosary. And I think they shared it from basilica to basilica. The Pope did the first decade and, uh, and then another church did the next and everybody could see what was going on. It was rather uh, uh, fascinating. Um, the popularity of the rosary has been attributed to St. Dominic and the Dominican order and it grew out of the lady, laity's desire to have the 150 prayers of the Psalms, which monks chant in monasteries, made available to them in a simple form. 
and the rosary uh, was that. So in 1569, St. Pius V, who was a pope, officially recommended the praying of the 150 angelic salutations with the Lord's Prayer at each decade. A decade is 10 prayers, the 10 Hail Marys is a, we don't, it's spelled decade, but when you refer it to it in the rosary, it's decade. Okay, let's say that. Decade for 10 years, decade for 10 Hail Marys, okay. So you have to pronounce it properly, um, although the spelling is the same. Um, it begins, uh, the rosary be, uh, let me see, um, uh, while meditating on the mysteries which recall the entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is where Pope John Paul II threw a monkey wrench into the 150 uh, psalms that the uh, uh, 15 original um, mysteries of the rosary, which were, there are five sorrowful, five uh, glorious, and five uh, joyful. And, and that include that's 15, and you would sp split these up during the, the week. So on, I can't remember the exact days, I think Monday uh, and Thursday were the joyful, Tuesday Friday. and Friday were the sorrowful, Wednesday was the, the and Sunday were the um, um, glorious, and then Saturday was always uh, the joyful, because it's related to Mary. Perfect, it was just perfect. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> Then, uh, in the year of the Our, Our Lady, and I, I think this was um, in, after, in the 2000s, uh, maybe the early 2000s, I, I think, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Pope John Paul II got this bright idea, that he would add five more, rose, uh, five more mysteries to the Holy Rosary and call them the luminous, or the, the mysteries of light. Uh, and those mysteries are um, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by St. John, the, the wedding feast of Cana, where he performs the first miracle, the proclamation of the gospel, or, or Jesus uh, proclaiming the, the kingdom of God in his ministry, the transfiguration, and then the institution of the Most Holy Eucharist. Now, what day was the Most Holy Eucharist instituted by Christ? Thursday. On Holy Thursday. So, what day is, are the luminous mysteries as an option prayed? I'm, you're pointing to me. Oh, I thought, see, you told me when you made signs that the, the tape had run out. And he's over there making signs at me, and I don't know what he's talking about. So, <laughs> it's a lie. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, but anyway. So, now there are 20 mysteries, and there are only 150. Uh, so, if you prayed all, originally, in the traditional form, if you, you could pray all 15 mysteries at one setting. In fact, the full rosary would have... Um, uh, three additional, you know, it'd be 150 beads for the Hail Marys to cover all of the, the mysteries uh, related to the 150 Psalms. So now that we have these five extra, it's just throwing a monkey runs into everything. But anyway, yeah. but those are very beautiful uh, uh, mysteries and uh, the, the luminous ones. In fact, when the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to the three peasant children uh, in Fatima in 1917, she asked them to tell the world to pray the rosary every day. Now, this is a personal revelation. The church has confirmed that it's worthy of belief, but if you, as a Catholic, choose not to believe in a, a, a private revelation revealed to children who themselves were the only ones that received the message, so there's not a way to verify it, uh, you can believe in it or you don't have to. But it has been believed by so many that um, that, the Holy Ro that praying the rosary daily is recommended by our Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother, uh, each and every day. Also, you may not know this, uh, at Mary's appearance to the peasant children at Fatima, she also predicted uh, the outbreak, this is in 1917, the outbreak of uh, World War II, and that the Pope of that period would suffer greatly. Uh, um, even afterwards uh, for this uh, event. So there was, it's a very, uh, very interesting thing. So the mysteries of the rosary center on the events of Christ's life. The joyful mysteries recall aspects of the incarnation, the annunciation, the visitation, the nativity, and the presentation of Jesus in the temple, which we celebrated today at Mass, and the finding of the child Jesus after three days in the temple. The sorrowful mysteries focus in on Christ's suffering and death, the agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning with thorns, the carrying of the cross, and the crucifixion and death of Christ, the passion. 
And the glorious mysteries are the resurrection, the ascension into heaven, uh, the sending of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles at Pentecost, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the crowning of Mary as the Queen of Heaven and on earth. And here it is, it says, in October of 2002, Pope John Paul issued an apostolic letter on the Most Holy Rosary, and in that letter the Holy Father added five additional mysteries, which we've talked about, the luminous ones, the baptism of the Lord, the miracle at Cana, the proclamation of the Kingdom of God, the Transfiguration, and the Institution of the Most Holy Eucharist. The repetition of the Ten Hail Marys and each mystery is meant to lead us to a restful and contemplative prayer related to the mystery. For example, let's say that um, uh, 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 the, on the crucifix, when you begin the Rosary, you would pray the Apostles' Creed. Then, uh, on the space between the crucifix and the, the, the uh, uh, first um, bead, you would in name the intention normally for the first three, uh, the f at first you'll say for an increase of faith, hope, and love. Then you would pray the Our Father uh, on the, uh, the first bead, the three Hail Marys, and then in the space between the third and, and the, the, the next, you would do the glory be to the Father. Then on the next bead, you would announce the first mystery. Okay, so if, if today is Thursday, the first mystery is the uh, baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by St. John. So you announce that aloud or to yourself if you're praying privately. Then uh, you pray ten Hail Marys, and the beads help you to count those, okay? So you go, so it keeps you from doing 20 Hail Marys when you only want to do 10, uh, or three when you want to do 10. So, so you keep praying, and as you're praying the Hail Marys, you're thinking about Jesus being baptized in the Jordan. You're meditating upon that, but you're praying the Hail Marys. So the Hail Marys are meant to be background meditative music to your meditation on Jesus being baptized in the Jordan by John, and you can reflect on that in any way you wish. To the, to the scenery of that, to what it must have been like, to hearing the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. Whatever you want to do during that 10 Hail Mary period, it's up to you. But you're doing two things at one time, right? You're praying the, the Hail Marys and meditating. And that brings about a, a, a sense of peace to many people that they don't experience in any other prayer. Uh, so it's a very uh, comforting prayer. It's a very it's better than yoga, I think. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a very medit it's meditation. It's, it's, it's not a mantra, but it's like a mantra. Uh, so it's, it's very important. So that's the Holy Rosary. Um, objects such as holy water, palms, ashes, candles, and metals are sacramentals as well. I wear a medal around my neck, and when I was little, um, we were, my dad taught me, and I don't know if this was an official teaching of the church, but it's always stuck with me. He says you shouldn't wear your religious medals outside your clothes, but underneath them, because it's only important for you to know that you believe in Jesus, uh, or that you are looking for the protection of, of either Jesus or Mary or one of the saints. So I wear a crucifix uh, around my neck, and I, I wear it all the time, uh, and never take it off but it's under my clothes. Uh, when I was little, a baby, uh, an uncle of mine in Italy gave me a, a, a medal that I wore for many years, but then I, it, it, the hook on it that was on the chain wore out and I lost it, yeah. you know, it dropped off. So, so this, was, this was given to me by somebody else. Now, when I say you, don't, uh, you, know, you hide the, the medal, uh, that's not really a, a, a law of the church. If you wish to wear religious insignia where people can see it, it's quite permissible as a Catholic to do that as well. The rosary technically is not meant to be jewelry. You'll see rock stars and, and others who have no idea what this means wearing it as jewelry around their neck. I can remember when I was being taught how to pray the rosary, I thought, isn't this nice? And I put it around my neck and my father said, that's not jewelry, take it off! Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> It's to be prayed with. Um, so normally you would not use this as a, a, a decoration. Yes? Yes, I was, I was curious. As a, they, uh, I've heard someone say, like, if a rosary is wooden or non-metal, 
as opposed to being metal, it was a different meaning of some sort. Like Oak Not that I'm aware Oak. of that. Like well, what different organizations could choose to give additional meaning. I'm not aware of what those are, but that's possible. But it's up to the organization. It's not a mandate of the church. Okay. Right. Correct. Correct. Divine mercy is another sacramental, as a matter of fact. Yes. So one way or the other, if it's metal or if it's not metal, it doesn't matter. If it's immaterial or whatever. Right. And now the Opus Dei might say, well, you should buy a metal one, and and this is the significance of it. But that's just their own uh, designation of that. Okay. okay. Or the, the the. I'm sorry. Yes. The nuts wore huge wooden beads around their waist. Yes. And they were always. And they were the complete rows where they had all 15 decades. And it was. They could wear those. Yes. See, and that's what I asked my father. Well, Sister Mary Gerald wears her rosary bead around her waist. Why can't I wear it around my neck? And he said, shut up. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sister Mary Gerald was the principal of the uh, elementary school I went to. Um, God rest her soul. Um, but speaking about insignia or different, this uh, rosary is the Knights of Columbus rosary, and there is um, the Knights of Columbus emblem on this metal piece that where the, the split and the, the beads occurs. So that's just what they wanted to do. It's, uh, and you, so there's, there's freedom and flexibility in uh, the sacramentals of the church. There's different, sometimes there's an image of the miraculous metal or the, the head of Christ, it's, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's whatever the designer of that rosary decided to put on it. Yeah, yeah it would be Mary, possibly, yes, yes. Like with rosaries, I mean, as far as flexible goes, I mean, can't little kids make them out of macaroni? Yeah, you can do whatever you want with them. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've seen rosaries that glow in the dark, you know, the, that stuff that uh, glows in the dark. So. Uh, so there's all kinds of things, macaroni, uh, peas, what, you know, if, he does, if a child doesn't want to eat his peas, make a rosary out of it. So, <laughs> so yeah. okay. But those ones that they have at the bookstore used to have for a dollar and they glow in the dark and they're plastic. Yes. They yeah, they're, they're, they're great. They're great. Again, there's lots of flexibility. Um, objects such as holy water, when my blessed water becomes holy, it's separated for sacred use and for blessings. Uh, on Palm Sunday, we'll bless palms. Uh, on Ash Wednesday, we'll bless ashes and impose them on your head. On the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord, which was today, we blessed candles. And I have enough, I think, for everyone to take one home. This is what we bless today. It's in this box of the Mass. We also bless the candles that we will use tomorrow and tonight for the uh, blessing of throats. And that'll be another sacramental that you'll experience firsthand this evening. Um, so that's always done on Candlemas Day. And there was, what we did this morning was very beautiful. There's a, a ceremony that accompanies the Mass, but before the Mass, we gathered, in fact, uh, uh, Mark Ermine was the person that passed out the candles that the people would hold, which were these. And we gathered at the entrance of the church, but on the inside, and we lit these candles. Everybody that had one had it lit. And then we had a, a representation of the candles we used for the uh, masses and everything else on a table. And there was a, 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 an introit sung, um, and I chanted that, and part of it in Latin. Then Father David was the celebrant, and he blessed the candles, sprinkled them with holy water. And then we processed in to the altar with the people behind us, and they took their places in the, the pews, and then the Mass began. It's a very beautiful Mass. I wish we could do it on Sunday, but I prefer for it to be on the official day rather than transfer to the following Sundays. But, but uh, you know, the church celebrates and sanctifies every day and every week of the year by special ceremonies. And in, in and of itself, that would be a sacramental. We wear medals. Uh, beginning um, this coming Monday, we're going to be doing what is called the, novena, the Perpetual Novena in honor of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. And it's a short prayer service. It'll be in the church in front of Mary's altar at 5 p.m. every Monday. And there's a medal that's associated with it, which I had. Here it is. Um, and we're going to pass these out for the first uh, Monday. Uh, these, these are cheap here, so if you wear them, it could uh, eat into your skin. But um, <laughs> <laughs> mine's the fourth, mine's the fourth. 
we're going to have a disclaimer. We cannot be held responsible for what these will do get. But, um, and then on the back it has an, uh, an image of what the Miraculous Medal is. And what you do during the, the, the Feast of the Miraculous, not the Feast, the, the Novena of the Miraculous Medal is it's just a prayer in honor of Mary. And then at a certain time, uh, you name your intention, whatever it is that you're praying for. There's a time for, of silence where you do that internally, quietly to yourself. A novena means nine times, but it's up to you to decide when that nine-day period, nine period will be. Okay, so we offer the novena every Monday of the year. You have a special intention. Let's say you want a cure from cancer, or you have a, a, a spat in the family that you want healing for. So for the next nine Mondays, depending on when you want to start, you make the novena and add that specific intention. And the hope is that there will be a resolution, one way or the other, to what it is that you are requesting. Okay? Now it's not a magic act, it's just a, a disciplined way of, of praying. Or let's say you can't go nine consecutive Mondays. Well then you could go nine months. Okay, the first, let's say, the first Monday of each month and do it nine months that way. So it's up to you. There's flexibility. Uh, and the intention is yours. And when you start the novena and end it is up to you. Does that make sense? We just provide the uh, time for it. You decide when to do it. Okay? Uh, so that's something you might want to experience. Um, No, yeah, yeah. The Old Testament, you know, you you would put blood on the lamp on the the doorpost, and there were other things, you know. Sure, it, it comes. All of this, there's a a long history, you know, and you meaning giving to things. The Christmas tree is a sacramental that we borrowed from paganism and gave a Christian meaning to, uh, but it's a sacramental. The um, um, the Easter egg is a sacramental. Uh, which has pagan origins, but now represents, you know, just as the chicken bursts forth from the egg, that's a sign of uh, the resurrection of Christ birth, bursting forth from the tomb. Uh, and that's the sacramental as well. So there's all kinds of things as we're speaking that are coming to my mind as well. Um, the, now there are also exorcisms that are sacramentals. They are not sacraments, but in a sacram uh, but it is a sacramental. But even though there are sacramentals, only in the Catholic Church, only a bishop, priest, or a deacon are allowed to perform exorcisms. Okay? Now, and there's a, a prayer that there's an actual official prayer, but it's not a sacrament, it's a sacramental. Uh, now there are two types of, of exorcisms. One is called minor. And every person that was baptized a Catholic uh, received, even as an infant, a minor exorcism during the baptismal ceremony. Uh, uh, so every baptism that I do, uh, it, there is, it's very clear that this is uh, a request before the baptism that whatever is unholy by virtue of original sin is removed from this child. In the old form of baptizing people prior to the Second Vatican Council, when it was in Latin predominantly, uh, it was even clearer. In fact, I, I've done three of those since it was allowed to do them again, uh, that form of baptism, and I'm almost shocked, you know, at, uh, how explicit the words are uh, concerning the evil one and, and asking God to uh, chase that evil spirit away from this child and to protect the child. Um, so th those are minor exorcisms. Those of you beginning the first sun, the second sun, those of you who are already baptized on the second Sunday of Lent, we will have a minor exorcism for you during Mass. And the prayer is not scary at all, uh, but, but it is a prayer for you. And then on the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent, for those of you who are not baptized, and how many do we have this year, uh, Jerry, that are not baptized? Two. Just two. Okay, you're going to have exorcisms as well, but they're not called, we don't call them exorcisms, we call them scrutinies. But the prayer is clearly directed at asking God to purify you of anything that is unclean or unholy or of Satan. And the prayers are, are, are very beautiful. 
Uh, so you will experience that through the RCIA process. Now there was a hand up over here. Well, mm -hmm. I had my hand up, and I was going to ask mm -hmm. that same thing for, has, is this part of uh, confirmation routinely? Because I'm wondering if I ever had a minor exorcism. Well, when you were baptized. Perhaps while I was baptized, yeah. though, in a Protestant domain. Oh, I say no, then you wouldn't have had it directly, correct. Now, it depends on when you came into the church. When did, and see, 2000. 2000 you, during Lent, didn't they do some prayers over you? During, I'm sure they yes, did. those would be, that, the, would that, be that, that would have been it. Yes, I yes. And we recovered that since the Second Vatican Council, the, the, the scrutinies. That's a, a recovery. We didn't do that for adults prior to the Second Vatican Council. Is your head going to turn all the way around? Possibly, yes. <laughs> And if he does, I'm the first one out of the church. Okay. <laughs> Good pastor that I am. Yes. <laughs> Did you have a question? No, I was, uh, you were asking how many people had not been baptized. And I was yeah, you're one of the ones, so you'll be exercised. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so he's done three times. Right, those that are not baptized, there are three Sundays where we pray over them. Uh, and you'll, you'll, hear, you'll see it, you'll hear it. It's part of the dismissal. So after the homily, you'll come forward, uh, there's a prayer, and then we dismiss you. But the prayer is an actual exorcism, minor exorcism. Is that before we come down here? Yes, before we come, just like we do when we dismiss you on Sundays. Then there is what is called a major exorcism. And this is for someone who is demonically possessed. These are very rare in the Catholic Church. Only a priest that has been designated as an exorcist by the bishop are, is allowed to do this. Or if another priest does it, he has to seek permission. But before an exorcism can be accomplished on anyone whom, it, it, whom we believe is possessed, uh, everything else has to be ruled out. A mental illness, a physical illness, feigning, uh, you know, that they're possessed, seizures, whatever. Uh, everything else that medical science can do to determine the cause of why this person is acting the way they are has to be ruled out. Then, once that is kind of certified by those in the medical profession, then the priest who is going to do the exorcism must seek permission from the bishop, okay? Now, this is normally internal, meaning it's not publicized, it's done privately. Uh, and only the, the, technically, the only ones that know that it's occurring are uh, the person that's being exercised and any family members that have been a part of taking care of this person and seeking a spiritual remedy for uh, what is clearly a demonic possession. Uh, and then there's a, they've just revised it, and I, I don't know what it is, but the, uh, there is a ritual for the prayer of exorcism which entails the use of holy water and saying various prayers and repeating them. And, and then the major exorcism sometimes has to be uh, um, done again over the course of several days. Um, so so it, it is quite possible. How many of you all have seen the movie The Exorcist? Okay. Now that was based on a true story. And what's interesting, now I'm sure Hollywood, you know, jazz it up a little bit, but, but from what I understand, from the priest who actually did the exorcism, that Hollywood got it pretty close. Okay, uh, there was some obviously. I just that. Yeah, we, yeah. You know, it was theologically pretty accurate. Yeah, it was, and the prayers were very accurate. And but the truth of the matter is that uh, the movie changed some things, or the book changed some things of the actual historical event. But it did occur in Georgetown, in Washington D.C., and it was not a girl; it was a boy, and he was Lutheran. And uh, the <laughs> that, no 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 it's in but he was experiencing this and, and the the family was a religious family and they had gone to determine trying to figure out what the heck is going on with this child and they exhausted every means and then they learned about the Catholic Church's use of major exorcisms and made contact with the Catholic bishop and once everything was ruled out that it wasn't you know something else causing this then they were allowed to have a Catholic exorcism. And the priest that did it, and it did work. It, it did work. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry? The right. The movie, I haven't seen the movie, so I'm not sure if it's true or not. Is that the one, who, 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 who starred in that? Oh, I did see that, yes. That was supposedly based on a true story, but, uh, and it was, it was interesting 
uh, I thought the exorcist was a little bit more uh, powerful than that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's not get off too track. I know this is yeah, fascinating stuff, but we got a little. I thought this was going to be a short class tonight, actually. <laughs> okay, very good. So anyway, uh, uh, for a major, so you know, a lot of times you'll see Protestant churches doing exorcisms, uh, evangelical, maybe Pentecostal, and it's very public. And you know, I'm really uncomfortable with it when you make an automatic determination that somebody is possessed without looking into it. Um, they could be, you don't know. The church says that lay people, and including priests, should never engage in evil spirit, meaning you should never speak to an evil spirit or speak to the devil himself. Uh, that you should always uh, call upon God to deal with that. God, would you please protect me? Uh, rather than saying, you know, whatever spirit, spirit of whatever, get away from here. Uh, you should not deal directly, uh, but only through uh, God directly, Jesus Christ, or any of the saints or whatever. Um, in fact, in the Catholic Church, uh, from the 1970s, we have what's called the Charismatic Movement, which draws a lot of Protestant Pentecostal uh, elements in, our, in the spirituality of the Charismatic Movement. And one of the things that they were doing in the um, um, Catholic communities of, of, of charismatic Catholics were doing what's called deliverance, where they would pray over someone who they thought was experiencing a demonic oppression, not necessarily a, 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 a what do you call it, possession, but a, were being oppressed. Uh, and that's okay to do when you call upon somebody and you want to pray over them, that's fine. Um, it's not truly an exorcism or even a minor exorcism. It's, it's praying for someone who might feel that they're being inundated, so to speak, or, or influenced, let's say. But they went, some of them, uh, in Augusta this occurred, some of them were going a little bit too far where they were naming demons that they thought were in the person and telling the demon to come out. Now, as a pastor of, a, of many of those in my parish, I reprimanded them for that. I said, this is not how we do this as Catholics. And you should not be making the diagnosis, first of all, nor speaking directly, if in fact you're right, to the, uh, the demon that's there. Uh, that's for someone else to do. Uh, so that's just a, just a, a word of warning. <clears throat> but certainly lay people could pray over someone if they wished, uh, lay hands on them if they wished, to ask God's release of anything that might be oppressing the person, whether it's actual uh, demon or depression or whatever. Yes? Um, you can tell him to leave. With, uh, it says in Scripture where uh, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Uh, resist the devil, you know, and he will flee from you. Yes. Right, but, but the church, of course, the, the, right, but the church, of course, regulates that. Uh, so you don't just rely as a Catholic on, on what may have occurred in the Old Test New Testament times. You have to listen also to what the church allows in that regard. So, so we don't, we're not just Bible alone, in other words. Yes? You remember the scripture, I think it was in Acts, where somebody was supposedly casting out demons, and the demon overcame him, and he said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? And it didn't work. And so mm -hmm. Peter had to perform the writing. Yes, yes. Was there another question? Yes. Right here. Billy. One of the readings, I think last week may have been whenever Jesus cast out and, and sent the um, demons into the pigs. Mm -hmm. And first wife. In a true exorcism, does the, I mean, is, is the demon trained? We don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess it could be possible, or the demon would go elsewhere. Not necessarily because you want him to go elsewhere, but, but he does. Uh, but some of the manifestations of demonic possession are, are close to what you saw in the movie The Exorcist. Uh, uh, speaking unusual languages that the person does not know uh, is one of them. Uh, uh, yes? Um, getting back to what you were saying, um, like the go-to method for some people, like say Mr. Buck, who's a lawyer, and that other that little guy with the beard and the glasses. <laughs> 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 Mark. <laughs> 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 Their go-to method 
Their go-to method as, as, as a way of approaching things is to argue. Being attorneys, that's how they are, are trained and all that. My go-to method is as a warrior. I want to fight these people. I want to do battle with these people and make them go away however I can. I mean, what would I do? I mean, you say you should ask permission. You can't as a layperson, but you can pray that God would release somebody, okay? But you should not be performing any kind of exorcism. What, what, what are you going to do? You stay away from it. <laughs> stay away. That's all. My final word of warning, stay away. Okay, yes. <laughs> I would say uh, not to engage the person. The, 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 pray, oh God, deliver me from this. Deliver me. You know, that's fine. Yeah, or deliver this person. Yes. Right. Correct. Sure. Right. Is because if lay people and people who don't know what they're doing uh, try to do this, they're kind of playing, and you end up supporting someone's psychosis by doing this kind of thing. Or harming them further. Yeah. So you end up doing more harm than good. Correct. Correct. That's a good, very good point. Yes, Jack. And it's manipulation is what it is. And that's what you have to be very careful of, that you don't manipulate somebody who is psychologically prone to being manipulated. Yes. How would a person become possessed in the first place? How can a person become possessed? That's a good question. We don't know. You could open yourself to uh, immoral materials that could then weaken you and, and the devil would find a happy home. Um, so so uh, we don't know. But, but innocent children are possessed sometimes, so we don't know why. It's a, it's a mystery. Okay, we're moving on. Okay. The most important thing is that there is a connection between the liturgy of the church or the sacraments of the church and the sacramentals or popular devotions. Um, but these sacramentals and popular devotions are not as powerful as the sacraments of the church, but are meant to support our participation in the sacraments of the church. Does that make sense? So they're, they're meant to be something we can do every day if we wish uh, without having to come to Mass and have a priest perform that, uh, the, the celebration, but it's meant to strengthen our faith and our devotion, our love for God or the saints or the Blessed Virgin Mary, and to feel connected to God and the church through these sacramental experiences. Okay? So the, the chapter is pretty clear, I think. This is one of the good, question, uh, good chapters uh, in, in this catechism on that. So what I'd like to do now, um, we've had a pretty good discussion. I thought we would conclude with praying a decade not a decade, uh, a decade of the Holy Rosary. Um, and uh, if you don't have your rosary, that's fine. You can use your fingers. Did you know that? If you don't have your rosary, you can just use your fingers. You've got ten, most of us do, unless something happened to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, or you could use your toes. That, although that's hard, harder to do. But <laughs> so, so it's up to you. I, I, you know, sometimes um, people will request, in fact, the majority of times in, this, in Macon, at funerals uh, for the wake service the night before, they request... Uh, of the rosary, and one, once or twice I've gone to the funeral home and I forgot to bring my rosary bead, and so I had to use my fingers. Uh, of course, I had them down where they couldn't see them because they thought maybe I had the rosary hidden underneath, but I was using <laughs> you know, my, my fingers to pray the rosary. So what we're going to do is pray one decade of the Holy Rosary, and then, quietly, I'm going to bless each person's throat that is here, uh, and if, as I'm doing that, if you could maintain silence, uh, but once you get your, your throat blessed, uh, um, well, actually, you can't leave because, uh, uh, well, actually, why don't we let you do your announcements, and then I'll conclude, and then they'll, we'll be finished. So Jerry's going to say a few in the rosary, which, is your, which you can do as well. You don't have to do the full rosary. If you only have time to do one decade, decade then uh, just do one. Uh, uh, so that's perfectly uh, permissible. Then when I bless your throats, it's not just for your throats that this sacramental is offered. But the prayer that I'll say to each one of you is this. Through the intercession of St. Blaise, Bishop and Martyr, may God deliver you of every disease of the throat and every other illness in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not just for praying for your throat, but every disease. So this is a, a, like a laying on of hands uh, and, and blessing.
So we'll do that as a conclusion. That'll be the final blessing, but each one of you will get a personal blessing. Um, and then, as I mentioned, if you would depart in silence or go back and eat so that as I'm blessing the throats, there's not, um, you know, a lot of talk, any talking. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we reflect on the um, fifth luminous mystery, which is the uh, Jesus Christ instituting the Most Holy Eucharist uh, on Holy Thursday. Let us reflect upon uh, the Most Holy Eucharist and the real presence of Christ and how uh, He brings us to Himself in the most intimate and personal way possible. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all peoples of heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And now we'll do the blessing of throats. I'm going to stand over here in this corner, so just come up to me. And if you wish to take home a blessed candle on Candlemas, just pick one of these up and that is yours.